Hassan al Banna, born in 1906 and died in 1949. During the 19th and early 20th centuries, a significant part of the Muslim world was colonised by prominent European powers such as France, Britain, Holland and Italy. And although Egypt has been a bastion of Islamic culture and tradition since the beginning of the 7th century, in 1882 the British invaded and colonised this important Muslim country. The ruling British elite not only maintained a tight political and military grip on Egypt, but also introduced and promoted Western education, culture and values across the country. Being loyal and proud Muslims, the Egyptians resented foreign interference in their internal affairs. Indeed, the Egyptian masses considered the British attempt to liberalise and westernise their country as an open attack on the Islamic identity, culture and heritage. Faced with mass opposition and resentment, in 1922 the British were forced to grant limited autonomy to Egypt, although the Egyptian people continued to campaign for their full independence. Their campaign eventually forced the British authorities to withdraw their forces and quit Egypt. Though the British occupation of Egypt formally ended in 1936, they continued to exercise considerable political, economic and cultural influence in the country. As the main mission of the Egyptian liberation movement, led by prominent leaders like Said Zaghloul, was to throw the British out of their country, they made no attempt to counter the spread of secularism and westernisation in Egypt, which threatened to wreak havoc within Egyptian society at the time. The Jamia al-Ikhwan al-Muslimun, or the Muslim Brotherhood, was destined to fill this moral and spiritual vacuum. Founded by Hassan al-Banna, this mass Islamic movement attempted to arrest the spread of secularism and westernization in Egypt by rejuvenating the Islamic ethos, morals and values across the country. And in the process, the Muslim Brotherhood became one of the 20th century's most powerful and influential Islamic movements. Hassan ibn Ahmad ibn Abdurrahman ibn Muhammad al-Banna al-Sa'ati was born in the Egyptian village of Mahmudiyah. His father, Ahmad ibn Abdul Rahman al-Banna, hailed from a lower middle class Egyptian family and attended Al-Azhar University, one of the Muslim world's most famous seat of Islamic learning and scholarship. He earned his living by repairing watches and pursued research in hadith, the prophetic traditions and fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, during his free time. He edited and wrote several commentaries on the works of classical scholars like Ahmad ibn Hanbal and al-Shafi and led prayers at his local mosque. Ahmad's personal piety and love of books, he had a large personal library of traditional Islamic literature, inspired young Hassan al-Banna to commit the entire Quran to memory as a child. Heavily influenced by his father, he used to say, Islam is my father and I have no other. After completing his elementary education at home under the care of his learned father, he enrolled at a local government-funded teacher's training centre, where he successfully completed a three-year course, and then he applied to join the Daralum, Cairo University, to pursue higher education, where he was offered a place at this institution. His family moved to Cairo, where, in 1927, he passed his final exam. And thus, at the age of 21, he took up his post as a teacher at the government school of Ismailia. During his student days at Daralum, al-Banna observed the social cultural condition of his people very closely, and what he saw utterly shocked and horrified him. The mass influx of Western culture, values and habits into Egyptian society, he felt, had severely undermined the traditional Islamic culture and ethos. This was happening at a time when the ruling elites were busy consolidating their own political position, while leading Egyptian intellectuals 
and literary figures like Taha Hussein and Ali Abdul Razik were seeking to deconstruct traditional Islam. And to add insult to injury, the masses also began to succumb to the lures of modernity and westernization, leading to a flagrant disregard for and violation of Islamic principles and practices across urban Egypt. When Al-Banna was posted to Ismailiyah, we were surprised to observe how the forces of modernity and westernization had transformed that locality too. And this prompted him to regularly visit the local cafes and shops to invite the locals to return to Islam. Being neither a theoretician nor an academic, he propagated the message of Islam through personal contact. Once, when he was asked why he did not write books, he retorted, I write men. And true to form, he soon won the local hearts and minds, thanks to his polished interpersonal skills and eloquence. And the people, in turn, came to profoundly admire and respect him for his unflinching devotion to Islam. It wasn't long before Al-Banna gathered around him a sizable following in Ismailia. Encouraged by his success, he formally inaugurated the Ikhwan al-Muslimun in 1928 to revive traditional Islamic principles and practices in and around Ismailia. It wasn't clear at this very stage whether he envisaged this organisation to be a local endeavour or the beginning of a nationwide Islamic revivalist movement. Either way, the Brotherhood started off as a local association which sought to bring about moral and spiritual reform in Ismailia by inviting the local, both young and old, men and women, back to the original, pristine message of Islam. Al-Banna's experiment proved to be so successful that people from all walks of life flocked to the Brotherhood. And then again, such a response was not entirely unexpected because the people of Ismailia, like their counterparts in Cairo, Alexandria and other towns and cities of Egypt, had become very angry and disillusioned with the ruling oligarchy. The rulers were keen to maintain their status quo for their own personal benefit, rather than instigate much-needed political and economic reforms in order to improve and enhance their people's lives, whether they lived in urban Cairo or in the rural villages. When Al-Banna's call for spiritual and moral, social and cultural and economic and political reforms struck a chord with the locals, they became his fervent supporters, and this encouraged him to formulate the Brotherhood's religious philosophy, methodology of dawah, Islamic propagation, and organisational structure. Unlike Jamal al-Din Afghani and Muhammad Abdu, al-Banna was neither a political theorist or activist, nor religious thinker. Rather, he was a community activist who directly engaged with the people to bring about individual, as well as collective, reformation through preaching, exhortation and training. Just as his understanding and approach to Islam was broad and comprehensive, the organisation he founded was also inclusive and pragmatic. The Islamic concept of Tawheed or divine unity he felt provided the basis for a moral, spiritual, political, economic and social transformation of society for the betterment of the people. He shunned religious sectarianism and advocated the need for unity and solidarity. Based on a traditionalist understanding of Islamic principles and practices, inspired by the Prophet, his companions and early Islamic scholars, Al-Banna urged his followers and supporters to engage in devotional activities during the night time and strive hard to reform the society in accordance with Islamic teachings during the daytime. Since social and cultural change cannot be brought about individually, he encouraged his followers to work collectively under the banner of the Brotherhood. Being a gradualist rather than a revolutionary, he adopted a bottom-up as opposed to a top-down approach to social change and reformation. Indeed, his practical and down-to-earth approach proved hugely successful in Ismailia, so much so that during his stay there, he established several mosques as well as schools for boys and girls. He also set up 
social welfare organisations and even created employment opportunities for the local people. Six years after its inception, the Brotherhood became one of the most powerful and active Islamic organisations in and around Ismailia. During this period, Al-Banna also found time to marry and start his own family. Most crucially, he kept a detailed diary of his duties and daily activities. And as expected, his diary, published under the title Mudakhirat al-Dawa wal Memoirs of Propagation and Propagator, subsequently became an important source of information about his life and career. In addition to this, he wrote scores of articles on different aspects of Islam, which were later published under the title of Maqalat al-Hasan al-Banna, the articles of Hasan al-Banna. Also, keen to encourage his followers to purify themselves both physically and spiritually, he compiled a collection of religious sayings and supplication entitled Al-Mathurat, and this booklet was published and circulated widely by the members of the Brotherhood. Al-Banna stayed in Ismailia until 1933, when he was transferred to a teaching post in Cairo, and by that time the Brotherhood had expanded beyond his own expectations, and new branches began to mushroom everywhere. Eager to coordinate the activities of his expanding organisation, he abandoned his teaching career and became a full-time Islamic activist. As in Ismailia, here now in Cairo, he noticed how the people had become angry and disillusioned with the subservient attitude of the Egyptian political and religious leaders towards the British elites. His call for Islamic unity and solidarity therefore received a favourable response from the populace who flocked to the Brotherhood in their droves. New branches of the Brotherhood were soon established across Cairo so that by 1934 it had established its presence in no fewer than 50 suburbs of Cairo, thus attracting a mass following. And at the time, Al-Banna's main objective was to counter the popularity of Western culture and values in Egyptian society by calling the masses back to the original pristine message of Islam. And in so doing, he hoped to bring about a moral and spiritual transformation throughout the Egyptian society. As a successful grassroots-based organisation, the Brotherhood soon spread across Egypt and won the hearts and minds of the Egyptian people, including farmers, students, teachers, doctors, engineers and lawyers. And with this increasing popularity, the Brotherhood also expanded its activities in response to the people's diverse needs and requirements. In 1938, Al-Banna prepared a comprehensive programme for the Brotherhood and called for reform in all spheres of Egyptian society in the light of the Qur'an and prophetic sunnah. And as before, his call for educational, social, political and economic reforms went down well with the Egyptian people. Indeed, the Brotherhood's opposition to the British elites, coupled with its desire to create a full-fledged Islamic state in Egypt, soon won it widespread support across the country and during the period from 1939 to 1945, the Brotherhood became one of the largest and most influential Islamic organisations in Egypt. In response, Al-Banna changed the Brotherhood's organisational structure so that it could coordinate its activities more effectively. By establishing their own mosques, school, medical clinics, shops, community centres, women's groups, newspapers, magazines and recreational facilities without any support or assistance from the Egypt government. The Brotherhood effectively became a state within a state, given its wide-ranging services and activities. The command structure of the organisation also became increasingly complex. As the chief guide, Murshid al-Am of the organisation, Al-Banna worked very closely with a dedicated team based at his central office, Maktab al-Irshad. Although the central office was responsible for formulating the organization's policies and strategies. It was the members of the executive office, Maktab al Tanfidi, who were responsible for implementing its policies, procedures, and guidelines at the grassroots levels. Al Banna created many other layers of command within the Brotherhood 
to facilitate better communication and effective delivery of his services. His extensive knowledge and understanding of Islam, coupled with his vision, foresight and organisational ability, enabled him to translate the values and principles of Islam at a practical level. As the Brotherhood became increasingly popular in Egypt, the country's rulers and especially the powerful British elite and the Egyptian subordinates became very alarmed. They wrongly accused the spreading of anti-state propaganda. The authorities first outlawed the Brotherhood's newspapers and journals, including the famous al Minar, the Lighthouse magazine. And this was followed by the imposition of governmental restrictions and censorship on the organisation's religious activities, leading to the forced dispersal of its prominent leaders and activists from Cairo. Such measures were instigated by the government in order to undermine the Brotherhood, its unity and organisation, but following huge public outcry, the authorities were forced to relent. And then, in 1948, the State of Israel was founded in Palestine, and this prompted some members of the Brotherhood to spearhead a military campaign against the new country. A year later, the Brotherhood was outlawed by the Egyptian government, which led to widespread rioting, as well as the murder of the Egyptian police chief, allegedly by a member of the Brotherhood. In response, the government ar arrested all the prominent members of the Brotherhood and curtailed its activities across the country. The ensuing crisis eventually spiralled out of control when Mahmoud Fahmi al Nukrashi, the Egyptian Prime Minister, was assassinated, allegedly by the members of the Brotherhood. A month later, al Banna himself was gunned down on the streets of Cairo, allegedly by the Egyptian secret police. He was 43 at the time. And although he was succeeded by Hassan Ismail al Hudabi, who was a prominent judge and Islamic scholar. The Brotherhood and its leaders continued to be harassed, persecuted and repressed by all subsequent Egyptian governments. And in spite of this, the Brotherhood remained one of the most powerful political-religious organisations in Egypt to this day. Indeed, its message and popularity has spread across the Arab world. And likewise, al Banna's religious ideas and thoughts have influenced some of the most prominent Islamic scholars and reformers of the 20th century, including Sayyid Qutb, the influential author of the Fizilal al-Quran, in the shade of the Quran, Taqi al-Din Nahbani, the founder of the Hizb tahrir group, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, the founder of Hamas, the popular Palestinian Islamic resistance movement, and many others.